Hi, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Um, here on the panel, we're looking at Indigenous peoples' participation in international organisations. Uh, we've got a fantastic uh, set of panellists today. Um, it's, we've got five panellists, so it's going to be a little bit quick, but I thought I'd just set up the introduction to begin with. Um, I'd like to begin first by acknowledging where I am and where, all, where we're all listening from. And I'm in, uh, in Sydney here in Australia. It's a little bit early in the morning, but I'm, I'm here and I'm awake. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge, uh, begin by acknowledging that where I am at least is the meetings being held on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Uh, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, and this is something we do in Australia when we're having starting a meeting. And so if, if you, um, that's just how be aware of where we are. I'd like to start by getting that and thank you everyone for, for coming. Um, the speakers we have today um, are a wonderful group of people. Um, we've got uh, Ambassador Keith Harper, he'll begin. Uh, so Ambassador Harper is the, uh, is the chair of the Jenner and Block's Native American Law Practice, um, focuses practice on Native American affairs, litigation and international clients from private and public sectors. And from 2014 until 2017, he served as the US Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the UN Human Rights Council in Switzerland. Um, next we'll hear from uh, Daly, uh, Dr. Daly Sambadoro. Um, and uh, Dr. Daly, uh, is the chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council and an assistant professor of, of international relations at the Department of Political Science at the University of Alaska in Anchorage. Um, Claire Charters, Dr. Claire Charters is an associate professor at the University of Auckland and also has, like everyone here, has extensive experience uh, working in the United Nations. Um, and from 2016 to 2017, Claire was appointed by the president of the UN General Assembly to advise him on enhancing Indigenous people's participation in the United Nations. So I think it's wonderful to hear from Claire as well. Uh, we then have uh, Ms. Rani Yanyan. Um, and so Rani is a human rights defender and the advisor of the Chakma Circle Chief. Um, she's an alumni of the diplomacy training program at the UNSW in Australia. Um, and as a woman Indigenous leader, works with empowerment of Indigenous women, protests, violence against them, and regularly brings their issues in meetings in Bangladesh and abroad, including the UN. So it's great to hear from Rani as well. Um, and finally, um, Diego. Uh, Tituana is a diplomat in the Ecuadorian Ministry of Foreign Affairs who served as the permanent mission to the UN from 2014 to 2019 and was in charge of human rights, disarmament and international security agendas. So I think it's, again, as I was saying, a wonderful collection of people, um, all with very varied experience, but all with really significant experience as well, um, advocating for Indigenous people's rights at the United Nations and, and uh, more broadly. Um, in terms of the situation or the, the procedure today, each speaker will speak for about five to seven minutes and just sort of introduce, um, I guess, their expertise and what they've been working on um, most directly. Uh, I'm then gonna ask, um, at the end of this, the presenters will have a couple of moments to respond to each other if they have any comments to make, uh, and then I'll open questions. So I think you can have quick, if you have questions, you can answer them in the chat box, put them in the chat box now, and I'll go to them right at the end of the discussion. So there should be around 15, 20 minutes for questions at the end. Um, there is also uh, opportunity at the end of the presentation for a 30 minutes uh, uh, consent to continue the conversation window in Zoom. So you can conclude, you can continue on to that afterwards because uh, I think we'll be closed um, quite abruptly at one hour. And so there is time to have a quick chat afterwards if there's any further comments that you may have. Um, and you can join that by just clicking on the open Zoom room at the end. Um, but uh, that's enough from me. Thanks so much. And I'd like to um, ask uh, Ambassador Harper to begin, if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, great, well, uh, thanks, Harry. Um, it is good to be with everybody and this distinguished panel. Um, I, uh, I will apologize in advance. We're at a lake house and the, um, the, the internet is a little bit more glitchy than I would like, but, uh, um, but this is such an important subject. And I, I think the place we should start is a little bit of history. Um, as we know, in many uh, member states of the UN, uh, the United States certainly, uh, uh, people other than indigenous people made policy regarding indigenous people for generations, for centuries. Um, and, and, and the making of those policies without the voices of indigenous peoples impacting them was disastrous. I'll give you one example in the United States. There was a group of Northeasterners who probably most of whom never met a native person that they, that they knew of and certainly did not seek their counsel. Uh, in the 1800s established a policy called allotment where they took 
the estates of tribes and they divided it into individual allotments for each individual tribal member. Uh, the long and the short of it is, you know, uh, fast forward 40 years, and it was such a disastrous policy that a federal uh, uh, report uh, denounced basically all aspects of allotment. And then there came what became known as the uh, Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, which turned the corner on allotment. Um, of the 150 million acres that tribes had before allotment, they lost 90 million acres. Uh, in that process. So just imagine the kind of uh, disastrous impact that has. Um, so I, I, get, I wanted to start there because we know what happens when actual constituent, uh, constituent voices from in Indian country or indigenous peoples worldwide are not the drivers of both setting agenda and uh, setting and having the conversation we know the outcomes can be extraordinarily damaging. Um, and certainly it's been an issue of longstanding in the United Nations, but there has been a pronounced uh, problem with representation of indigenous peoples. Uh, and you know, we, we sh when we speak of this issue, the first question should be, who should speak for indigenous peoples? And you know, today in the United States and in many places, we start with the notion of self-determination. Uh, and uh, that means elected officials, in some cases appointed chiefs or recognized leaders, uh, should be the should, are, are the ones who represent a particular indigenous community. Because of how the credentialing works, uh, those voices are not part of the conversation. And certainly, it's true for uh, Indian federally recognized Indian tribes in the United States. And so, what happens is others speak for, their, for, for them, either governments speak for them, member states of the UN, or alternatively, uh, non-governmental organization, because they have recognized status. Uh, and it's been my experience that uh, the agenda is often set uh, by the NGOs. And in some cases, that's not a bad thing, because they are actually have strong ties to tribal communities, to indigenous peoples. In other cases, these NGOs do not have strong ties and they're sort of making it up as they go. Uh, and so the agenda may prioritize one kind of issue that may not be the central thing that is problematic within a particular member state. And it may not drive the conversation in a way uh, in which uh, representation from indigenous communities themselves would drive the conversation. Um, so we have to have a better and more consistent pathway for actual authentic indigenous representation to work. Um, and let's be clear, this is a problem of longstanding. I talked a little bit about history, but even within the UN setting, this is a problem of longstanding. Um, and that's why, in, for example, in the 2014 World Conference of Indigenous Peoples, one of the outcomes uh, of that, one of the principal outcomes from, from that was addressed specifically this issue. And I'm gonna quote from the, from the outcome document because one of the uh, things that it charged the UN was with doing is to quote, secure new rules that will give indigenous governments a more appropriate status in the UN and allow them to participate fully and permanently in UN processes and activities. Uh, and I saw this while I was serving in the UN Human Rights Council as the US ambassador, that too often uh, we did not have the kind of authentic representation certainly from the United States. Um, uh, we had some, uh, but it wasn't as robust as it could be with a system that fully recognizes the leadership uh, and, the, and, 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 and the, the, the elected leadership um, in, from Indian country. Um, uh, so what happened? Why, why did we have this 2014? We're now seven years later, and there's still not an effective uh, uh, means for indigenous peoples to be represented uh, consistently uh, and across the board. Um, and I think part, part of the answer is a political answer. At first, there was start, st staunch opposition uh, to this. We, we attempted to push it, uh, working with Canada and Scandinavian countries and many in GRULAC, Latin American countries in particular. Uh, but there was strong opposition from two permanent five members of the Security Council, Russia and China, and, uh, and certainly also countries like Indonesia and Botswana. 
so it, it just became very political very fast. The other thing that I would say is there are some tough questions when we're talking about who decides who is a representative of a particular indigenous group. Now, one answer could be uh, member states of the UN should decide. And, um, and certainly in some countries that might work. Uh, uh, in the United States, there are 570 odd federally recognized Indian tribes. If you said any of those could presumptively have status who then want to engage with the UN, that may work. It may work in Canada and in, 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 in other places as well. But what we have found is that too often there are also member states of the UN who will utilize that kind of power to exclude voices that um, are inconvenient for them uh, and include voices that basically speak the party line of the particular country. And so giving a veto for uh, the, the, the domestic uh, countries are not always or oftentimes not the best way. So one, one proposal that I remember we toyed with is having this sort of presumption uh, that if you're recognized by your home country, you should be authorized uh, within the UN setting as uh, an indigenous uh, leader uh, uh, speaking on the behalf of your, uh, of your constituents, uh, but that there will also be some kind of UN specific process um, where that, uh, even where a country decide, you know, does not include you in their list, there's still an ability for you to participate uh, if you qualify within this alternative, alternative means. Um, uh, you know, so I guess the last question I talked about before, uh, before turning it back um, is uh, how does this happen? And um, at least from my perspective, um, you need one or more of the more powerful countries within the UN system, making this a priori priority and having it be a, uh, a key outcome that they desire um, from, uh, uh, from, from the UN system. Uh, I think the United States could certainly do that. Uh, it would have to, have to happen in New York, um, in, in my estimation. Uh, it would have to, have, have to there, there would be a need to build a coalition. I think there is, there are countries out there who want to make this happen, but they would have to work through opposition and the challenging uh, questions that, that I pose, like, for example, exactly who gets to decide who, who qualifies and who doesn't. Uh, but I think it's possible. Uh, I, and I, but I think it's also insufficient to just have having indigenous people's voices uh, push for this. It has to be with states as well. Um, and I think what that leads to an, a secondary thing, which I think, uh, you know, uh, certain countries, New Zealand in particular, Canada, the United States, uh, especially Scandinavian countries, should think about appointing a special envoy on indigenous people's issues within their foreign ministry. What this will do, what this does is it signals to the world that they take these issues very seriously. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly uh, during my tenure, the uh, the Secretary of State created a special envoy in the Obama administrations for LGBTI rights. And that signaled to the world that the United States was going to make sure that discrimination and violence against LGBTI persons was something that was going to be a key priority. Um, and I think other countries uh, uh, can fall. The United States should do that with respect to indigenous peoples and other countries should do that as well. And I think if they do that, we will have the ability and energy to have real participation defined with greater specificity and greater inclusion and greater authenticity in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Harper. I think it's um, great and a very clear uh, uh, response about what, what needs to happen. Um, thank you very much, um, Bailey. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge what um, uh, the ambassador has said about the about the history and uh, also the the challenges and in, in this um, piece of advice in terms of how to uh, garner more uh, support for the work that uh, Claire has uh, headed up on behalf of Indigenous peoples. But I want to um, provide an, um, an Arctic and an Inuit perspective to some of these particular issues. Uh, when I sat to think about uh, my remarks here, uh, I wanted to frame them 
and from a personal perspective, um, in terms of my own participation, it goes all the way back to 1976 when Inuit, Inupiat especially, were challenged by the International Whaling Commission. And this was my first foray into international organizations and the effort to ensure that the uh, the, the whaling culture of our people was recognized and respected by the International Whaling Commission that had sort of subsumed um, uh, the issue of our food security uh, in the context of an organization set up to regulate commercial activity. Uh, as you can imagine, it was a, a challenge, but uh, it's an important example um, for one to take the long view that you can succeed in areas where you have had extraordinary difficulty. Of course, the forces of um, organizations like Greenpeace and others uh, were, were central to this particular challenge. But today, uh, by virtue of the work of our people through especially the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission, uh, we've been able to gain both political and intellectual space within the International Whaling Commission. Um, at the time, our organization, the Inuit Circumpolar Council, uh, was coordinated, organized, coherent about the need for an Arctic policy. Indeed, the key objective of the Inuit Circumpolar Council is to transcend the international borders that separate our blood relations in the Russian Far East, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland, and to tackle uh, the issues that face us uh, in that context. And uh, clearly, oil and gas development was uh, being proposed uh, in the Mackenzie Valley. Also, offshore oil and gas development was uh, under consideration. So we were compelled to, to, again, transcend international borders and organize in an effort to advocate for ourselves. And I raise these um, examples because uh, our messaging has been constant uh, in terms of um, the advocacy on behalf of our people. And I think, um, I think the ambassador raises important questions as to who um, is the uh, valid representative of uh, indigenous peoples. And in the case of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, we made very clear that we need a non-governmental organization to advance our voices. However, things have developed to the extent that our own people at a regional level across Inuit and Nunat um, are now uh, able to carry their own voices. And so this question about especially representation of our political institutions is absolutely crucial. Uh, and I think that we all should be mindful of the fact that um, this kind of representation needs to take place both within the United Nations, but also outside the United Nations. You have organizations like the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. I remember in 1984 going to the first IUCN meeting. We were the first indigenous people's organization to show up. We were shouted out of the room when we wanted uh, to gain representation within the IUCN. This was stunning. Uh, the the um, the force of the animal rights groups um, in the context of our desire to gain uh, greater understanding of our way of life uh, was uh, I'd never feared for my personal security ever before, <laughs> and and here uh, we thought that we were uh, maybe going to be welcomed by individuals that understood the uh, environment, ecosystems, biodiversity, and so forth. So um, I think that here again, as far as uh, the, the advocacy and the work of our own people within a whole host of fora and not just within the United Nations. Um, clearly the portfolio of human rights and the adoption of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is highly significant. And, my participation in that work uh, on behalf of the Inuit 
um, has yielded uh, an important human rights framework. And especially uh, when we talk about um, our right of self-determination and the present discussion, which I'm sure Claire will touch upon uh, as far as representation within the United Nations, but self-determination being the, the core of uh, the UN Declaration and uh, the fact that it is the same right of self-determination as understood in international law that applies and attaches to indigenous peoples. Um, of course, lands, territories, and resources, and that entire cluster of articles is equally as important. Um, so the UN declaration process, uh, if, if one takes the long view, um, we certainly have greater or increased uh, acceptance of this, of uh, even the vocabulary and its attachment to indigenous peoples. I wanna conclude my uh, comments by uh, pointing to the, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And uh, it's an example where there's been greater acceptance of indigenous peoples as a constituency. Indigenous peoples are a formal constituency within the UN Framework Convention. Also, the, uh, the recently organized facilitative working group, which has membership of both indigenous peoples and state party members, uh, this is extraordinary. There is no oversight uh, by states as to the appointment of indigenous representatives to the facilitative working group. This is huge in my estimation. Um, I know that, um, that there are a host of things I'd like to address as far as our work in the area of the marine environment, which is extraordinary as well, but I've taken too much time and um, would like to yield to others, but I, uh, my main point being that, um, that this history of activism and advocacy has yielded some important examples. Uh, I know that we have huge challenges ahead, uh, but I think that um, we have a pretty strong next generation and generation after to uh, lift all of us up uh, in a way that is fair and just respectful uh, toward uh, indigenous peoples as uh, legitimate peoples, nations, and communities. Thank you. Thanks, Daly. And I think um, it's a great message. And I think, uh, as you say, though, it's only possible now because of the work that's been put in for many, many years previously. And uh, you know, it's great to hear all the way back from 1976 about the work that, that you and, and other people set up really initially. So thank you so much. Um, Claire. Kia ora koutou, uh, ko Nati Fakoe te iwi, ko Claire Charters Toku Ingoa. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, with you and among, in your company. Um, so I want to make three main points. Um, and the first one is um, around the sort of development of something akin to um, Indigenous people's consent to uh, UN resolutions that impact on them. Um, and this is a, a development that I think is really important because it does um, signal that Indigenous peoples um, have something like free prior informed consent and self-determination in international decision making. Um, in the process that I've been, processes that I've been involved in, um, the first one was the declaration somewhat later than the 70s with um, Daly, but um, in that process I think that it was, it was absolutely key that Indigenous peoples supported um, or at least a vast majority, something that was very close to unanimity, um, supported the declaration. Otherwise, it would not um, have um, gone through. And that was that 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 requirement and taking away, I think, of um, authority from states to decide for Indigenous peoples. The point that Ambassador Harper um, talked about earlier was really key. Um, it also explains why it probably took so long for the declaration um, to go through um, and, and pass eventually in the General Assembly. But we see that process continuing on um, in the what you might call the international Indigenous institutions. So in the expert mechanism and the permanent forum where Indigenous peoples really set the agenda, I think. Um, as, those, as those recommendations go up the UN system, um, there is perhaps less sort of Indigenous domination, but, but certainly when it comes to the Human Rights Council's 
annual resolutions um, with respect to Indigenous peoples, there is again something akin to Indigenous peoples consent. Um, and also um, a partnership, I think, between Indigenous peoples advocates and state representatives in um, trying to agree to the content um, of those resolutions and also agenda setting what is actually in those, uh, in those resolutions um, as well. Um, and it is consistent with the idea or the catchphrase um, that to mind I first heard during declaration processes and that is uh, nothing about us without us. So I think that's positive and I think um, hopefully we can see an expansion of um, something like um, consent uh, of Indigenous peoples and uh, Indigenous peoples participating in, as equals uh, in some of these fora. So as has probably been foreshadowed, the second um, point or, or, or topic that I wanted to talk to was this 2016-17 uh, General Assembly process uh, trying to enhance Indigenous peoples' participation at the UN in a more permanent and secure and, and ongoing way. Uh, that, as has, has also been mentioned already by Ambassador Harper, was, was a process that was most immediately set up um, under the World Conference for Indigenous Peoples. But I did want to acknowledge that um, it has a pedigree going back to at least the 1920s when uh, Ratana from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Chief Deskahe um, made representations to the League of Nations. Um, and, and this has been an evolving thing, and it does have this very long pedigree, and I think we should acknowledge that. And uh, uh, going through the declaration, obviously, the, the uh, expert mechanism and various secretary general reports before it wound up um, in the General Assembly um, around 2015, 16, 17. And it's an ongoing process, but particularly uh, intense during that time. And uh, I think Ambassador Harper's also uh, mentioned and, and Daly's um, took up as well that the key issue that, that meant that, you, that the resolution was maybe um, not as robust um, as we wanted and why more work is required in this area. Um, and I'll comment on that in a moment, but that I did want to also mention that the gains um, and I think at least sitting as in, in the position that I was in as an advisor to the President of the General Assembly during this process, I think that there was um, acceptance that, that there needed to be permanent um, participation of Indigenous peoples across the UN, including in the General Assembly. Including in the General Assembly. Um, and while the form of that participation in a place like the General Assembly um, wasn't firmly decided, uh, I think that the fact that Indigenous peoples were accepted as something like uh, uh, partners in um, the General Assembly and on issues that, that impact particularly on Indigenous peoples um, is a really interesting development in international law generally. And this is a status, this would be a status that is very different from that of NGOs and reflects our self-determination and also reflects sort of a quasi former sovereignty position. So I, I did want to highlight that as a positive. And, and as mentioned, the key issue was, um, or the key problematic issue, and the reason why we didn't get further was around this veto that, that states um, want to determine who um, could participate as Indigenous peoples and who could have this, this status. Now, this goes really strongly against what Indigenous peoples required in the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and that's that states don't tell us who we are. Um, as has been explained, I think you can probably understand the reasons why some states, although it was actually a relatively small group, um, who objected to this. And my hope is that as this um, process builds up again, um, which I expect it to do in the very near future, um, that we can um, get movement on this. And, I, and I'm very interested also in the envoy um, idea mentioned. Um, and I do note also that, that our uh, newly appointed uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs, um, Minister Nanaya Mahuta, um, who is now our Foreign Minister, in Aotea New Zealand is a very strong um, Māori woman um, and I hope that her influence um, will pervade on issues um, impacting on Indigenous peoples. So the final point is, is really a small one um, and that is that Indigenous peoples have um, really changed the structure and uh, the way 
the processes involved with international lawmaking through our participation. Um, and this goes beyond just Indigenous um, issues, I think. And it is by including Indigenous peoples, I think we are, we are slowly moving towards decolonization, decolonizing the international legal system. It's a long road, um, and I'm sure it will continue, um, continue on for, for, for many years. But I think our input has is, is been tremendous to international law and keeping, um, not completely deconstructing international law, uh, but making it more uh, justice focused um, and flexible while retaining some level of formality. So we were working within the system, so within the General Assembly, within the, within the UN Charter and so on, um, but in a way that I think pushes open doors in the same way that in the 70s, um, our leaders did um, walking through those gates um, in Geneva, um, yeah, and starting off all these processes. So uh, kia ora koutou, um, I'll finish on that note. Um, and it is again, it's a great pleasure to be here and thank you very much. Uh, uh, for including me, and I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you, Claire. That's wonderful. And I think um, really interesting to hear, I guess, your thoughts on the idea that the, the process from 2016-2017 may, may start again soon, um, or, or, or and, and I guess hopefully a better outcome perhaps at, at, at that stage. But thank you again for your work on that. Um, Rani, if you'd like to speak now, thanks. Uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, I would first, uh, I would like to thank uh, American Society of International Law for providing me with this opportunity to speak at this uh, 2021 annual meeting. I feel privileged to be uh, with uh, our uh, distinguished panelists. I think um, uh, I'll be resonating with uh, what uh, Claire had just uh, mentioned that, um, you know, Indigenous peoples um, decades long efforts have uh, somewhat reshaped um, international law to some extent. Um, our elders, uh, our leaders uh, from different regions have challenged the lawmaking process uh, that uh, are uh, essentially uh, state centric. Uh, the states where indigenous people did not choose to belong. They did not have a say when the states were formed, rather it was imposed on them. Um, the long, uh, arduous process um, of uh, the adoption of uh, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and also the establishment of a uh, United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues uh, are the testaments that international law has somewhat become more uh, uh, flexible um, and uh, also uh, inclusive of um, uh, non-state entities. So us, uh, the Indigenous peoples from Bangladesh, uh, have been engaging with international law and international organizations for uh, more than two decades now. The sole reason for engaging with international law and the organizations uh, is to impose obligations on our state uh, so that they act in a just way. And uh, uh, when I say just, it is not only what we believe what just should be, uh, it is what all the nations have agreed upon, uh, like the UNGRIP, uh, an instrument that uh, we profusely use uh, to advocate for our rights, indigenous people's rights. Uh, within our country and uh, beyond our country. Um, while we think that uh, you know, international law can be a safeguard for uh, protecting indigenous people's rights, uh, it may also backfire uh, as uh, what we have experienced uh, in our country. So uh, UNDRIP was adopted in 2007 and up until 2010, uh, our government, uh, even our Prime Minister uh, used to send a solidarity message to Bangladesh indigenous communities uh, on the occasion of International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples. However, from 2011, uh, the government started to proclaim that there are no indigenous communities in Bangladesh. And it was reflected on, on, on the constitution that was amended that very year, uh, where we we are 
we were uh, labeled as a minor ethnic sex and minoritized. Um, today, I don't understand what minor ethnic sex means, but that's uh, what we are being called. The point uh, I'm, I'm trying to get to is that uh, no matter how we try to engage with uh, international laws and organizations, uh, with reasonable success or with little success, uh, there will be states and numerous states like ours uh, that will find an excuse, a way to deter us from getting the protection from um, international law. And uh, we will have to keep on navigating our way to find a, a way to make our government uh, accountable for uh, rights violations. Um, also, uh, even though our government denies the existence of indigenous peoples in Bangladesh, uh, it has religiously been uh, participating at the permanent forum sessions every year. So it means that the states cannot go past the United States and cannot uh, completely ignore uh, the in instrument, UNRWA, even though it is not legally binding. Had it been legally binding like other international uh, conventions and covenants uh, where the states are forced to justify their actions in front of the entire world. Uh, perhaps um, indigenous peoples would have had more chances to get protection under international law. Um, also the recommendations, uh, hundreds of them um, that have been discussed, uh, drafted uh, and adopted at the end of uh, each of the permanent forum sessions uh, would have carried more operational values than um, at the present. Uh, I would also like to point out, uh, I, I would also like to uh, focus on one of the points that uh, having an instrument like UNDRIP uh, in place uh, is not actually guarantee uh, the safety of the rights defenders uh, who engage with international organizations who participate uh, at various sessions, at various forums, uh, and platforms. Uh, uh, from my experience, uh, I've seen that our actions are labeled as um, anti-state actions, and uh, we are being vilified for speaking up at the world, age, world stage. Um, so I, I don't know how, but international laws uh, need to address it somehow. Um, I would like to uh, 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 finish my comments uh, by saying that uh, while uh, Indigenous peoples' persistence has created quite a few avenues where Indigenous peoples can engage with um, international law and organizations as um, uh, non-state collectives, uh, we still have a long way to go. Uh, as we all know that laws alone cannot uh, ensure protection, um, protection of rights. Uh, it's how um, we ensure how those uh, international laws are used in domestic context. Uh, we'll have to keep on working on the ground uh, as well at, uh, at the international arena. Uh, yes, we have challenges ahead of us, but also when didn't we have challenges? We have always faced challenges. Our elders, our leaders have faced challenges. And uh, my generation, our generation will face challenge. We are facing challenges. And we anticipate that uh, we will be facing challenges in the future. However, it's the, uh, the, the resilience of indigenous peoples uh, and also their persistence uh, to build a just world uh, We'll take this effort forward, I think, one step, uh, one step at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Rani. I thought that was excellent. And I think it's a, a great uh, reminder, I guess, that although um, everyone here in this panel and, and, and many other Indigenous peoples around the world have, have done a great job in, in trying to reshape and continue to reshape international law, as you say, it is really about um, how that is then implemented, how that is the effect that that has uh, in, in the real people's lives every day. So thank you. Um, I'd just like to, before we get to Diego, I'd just like to remind everyone that you can ask questions in the chat box as well. And there's a Q&A uh, widget uh, 
for those listening. So you can ask questions and I'll come to those questions um, to begin with at the start once we've finished um, our presentations. Thank you, Diego. Thank you. Ali Chichita Charipaichi Tukui, Kaipi Kakuna, Kai Tanda Nakuiman, Kayashkamanta, Tukui Shungugan Pagi, Yukanchi Kikinka, Kashkata Kaimana Jaktapi, Chuk Mama Jakta Kunapi, Kausa Kunaman, Rikshi Japami Munan. Good afternoon, the organizer of the event. With whom I'm ensuring this panel, it is an honor. And with those who are listening to us, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I have been invited to this event, suggesting a question with a, a great relevance. How should the participation of indigenous people in the UN enhance? And uh, well, I, I can say that indigenous people are often called upon to be consulted, but rarely to take decisions. We are also called to participate in debates, in conferences in different meetings in which sometimes there are already previous agreements. And so let me say, brother and sister, that uh, at least from my view, this is another true or real participation. And I will explain why I believe this during my intervention. Uh, I also have been asked to share my international experience and work in the process of the improve of participation of indigenous people at the UN. And what I can say uh, from this process, uh, what I can highlight is that for the five years, I had the honor and the responsibility of leading the only resolution of indigenous people that is adopted in the UN General Assembly. And why is this, this uh, resolution important? Because this resolution lies in the fact that the agreements reach it in the space that are implemented at the level of the UN system. And for this reason, processes start, processes are maintained, or processes are closed, which although are recommended by indigenous people, the final decision are taken at the governmental level. For example, in the last 10 the year, uh, in the last 10 year, what I can point out is that the resolution initiates, for example, the process to work for the World Conference of Indigenous People. With this resolution, I started the process of this uh, issue that we are addressing right now to improve the participation of indigenous people at the UN. The compromise the recommendation was coming from the outcome document, the World Conference of Indigenous People, but the process started because of the resolution of the rights of indigenous people at the UN. Also, what I can highlight from this resolution is that, for example, we decided to commemorate or to designate to 2019 as the International Year of Indigenous Language, and also to decide to establish a decade of indigenous language, just to mention some of them. Um, likewise, as a governmental delegate and as the first indigenous, indigenous career diplomat from Ecuador that joined the permanent mission of Ecuador, I had the honor of being involved in various and different negotiation processes in the UN. And this experience allowed me to recognize that one of the practical ways to improve our participation in the decision-making process at the international level is precisely being part of the spaces in which decisions are taken. Therefore, my direct suggestion to move forward with our proposal and that we ourselves explain the meaning of this. And this means that in each of the forums in matters of health, education, economy, migration, environment, our voices are presented. And for this, we must belong or be part of the diplomatic corps of the I wonder only at the level of Latin America, how many permanent representatives, I mean, indigenous ambassadors have been appointed to the United Nations. Currently at the United Nations in New York, I can recognize one, one from 33 countries. How many permanent representatives, indigenous ambassadors that we have at the UN in Geneva? At Latin America, Latin American level, I, my understanding is no one. How many indigenous brothers and sisters have been diplomatic functions 
or have been appointed as a diplomatic delegate to the United Nations in New York, Geneva, at the UNESCO in Vienna. If we bring together all the Latin American representation, we don't occupy even the five percentage. So this, this is the precisely the reality that we face at international level. And more than 75 years after the creation of the United Nations, indigenous people are not part of this decision-making space. And therefore, if we want to improve our participation at the UN, we must consider to address these inequalities, these gaps, and working to occupy this space. In this sense, I would like to promote a new notion of diplomacy, which includes indigenous people as the main actor, and I call it indigenous diplomacy. I believe that we must prepare the new generations of indigenous brothers and sisters so that they can reach this multilateral diplomacy. And for this, we require resources, training, exchanges, uh, language training, education in good universities, but always strengthening our identity and roots. The participation of indigenous people in the UN and in the multilateral diplomacy is essential but not in a false sense, not for photos, music, food, no, but for the inclusion of our vision and to share our knowledge. Just to mention, the knowledge of indigenous people in matters of maternal health, education, and the protection of natural resources are fundamental. For this reason, to improve the participation of indigenous people in the few instance, our presence in the space of war del deliberation must be improved, not to be consulted. Our presence in those spaces have to be to take decisions. Few countries in Latin America are moving in this direction, but there is still much to do in our region and in the different regions in the world. So finally, to, to conclude with my intervention, I would like to invite everyone to join to this struggle and to contribute from our capacities and strengths in the construction of these training spaces for indigenous diplomats and to team and to build the Academy of Indigenous Diplomacy. This is the experience that I have the last years. And I believe that we can have a real contribution if we can promote this appointment of indigenous people in the diplomatic process. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diego. I think that's uh, a great, um emphasis again as well about uh, putting in, making sure Indigenous peoples are uh, not just at the centre of diplomatic action, but are, are, cap are able to and um, are, yeah, able to be there and, and, and to know how to act in that sense and, and to get results for Indigenous people on their communities on the ground and, and moving beyond just consultation and what is participation and, and how to get those outcomes. So I think it's a wonderful thing to remind us all. Um, just for the last few moments now, I was wondering if there's any, uh, if any presenters would like to comment on anything else that they've heard. Um, just a couple of minutes here, here or there, if anyone wants to um, respond to someone that's been said or, or to, to flesh out a bit further uh, uh, an idea that they had. No, no, that's great. Okay, no worries. Um, otherwise, I thought now we'd go to some questions. So we've got one question um, uh, ready to go from an audience member from uh, Prayank Jain. Um, uh, the question here is, what collective strategies should Indigenous nations pursue in order to enhance their participation in international NGOs? Um, so what sort of collective strategies do you think that Indigenous nations should be looking for in order to improve uh, and to enhance their participation? Um, not sure if anyone would like to go first on, on that. Ambassador Harper? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess in my experience, um, uh, you know, from the state's perspective, from the from uh, representing a, uh, a government, um, in this case, in my case, the United States, um, uh, I think that we always perceived it as a problem that uh, one had to go through the NGO process, uh, and that. Um, it, it, and, and that the, the representation would be much better in, you know, uh, in, in the manner in which 
Ms. Charters was discussing, uh, if where the indigenous communities speak for themselves um, without, because the thing about NGOs and, you know, I, I'm a huge supporter of uh, participatory rights of NGOs. And, you know, we, we, uh, we, we often defended NGOs, even when we disagreed with them fundamentally and when they were criticizing us, um, uh, because it's important that no matter what they have to say, that they have their voice heard. That's essential, um, even if they're challenging conversations. Having said that, uh, NGOs also have their own constituencies. And oftentimes those constituencies are donors. Um, they're individuals who form the NGO. And they may or may not be perfectly in line with indigenous voices themselves, even if they are indigenous. They may be representing themselves, uh, but that doesn't mean they're representing a constituency, a group of people, a nation, a, a tribe, whatever the collective is. And, and that's the fundamental point of the Declaration of the Right, or one of the fundamental points of the Declaration, is that there is a collection. It's a peoples with an S. Uh, and uh, you're and th that entity that has to participate through leadership, um, through their, their, their own chosen leaders. Um, so uh, I think that's the box we need to get out of, is the NGO box. Um, uh, not that the NGOs don't have a place, and I think they should have a continuing role. Uh, but it has. To, but, but if we're going to get it right, if we're going to, and, and when I say get it right, meaning ha forming policies that really are reflective of indigenous communities, then we have to have a specific, different, identifiable, participatory right of indigenous peoples that is um, substantial and robust. I think that um, uh, one of the, the the shortest ways to answer uh, this particular issue, and, and I wholeheartedly uh, endorse uh, what the ambassador has just now said, and that maybe I wasn't clear when I made my remarks that the Inuit Circumpolar Council, as a non-governmental organization, we've been effective at bringing our people together and, and creating a united voice, but it's the rights holders, the, the rights holders that have to be front and center. And we're encountering that now, uh, especially when we look at the, the emerging legally binding agreements that are being set between governments and indigenous governments, indigenous rights holders. Uh, for example, the extraordinary and vast marine protected areas that are now, um, are, are now af uh, affirming rights of the rights holders in the offshore area of, um, of Nunavut, for example. Um, this, these agreements uh, have attracted constitutional protection they, uh, they resulted from uh, long-term negotiations. Uh, they affirm uh, the rights holders activities within the region. So I think that this is, uh, for us, it's a, it's a pivotal moment and we're gonna have to turn the corner uh, as an organization uh, to ensure that uh, we're, we're uplifting those rights holders in every context uh, that we possibly can, including the United Nations. So I think that uh, though the, the question is welcome that, that there are limitations to uh, non-governmental organizations as, as representative bodies of indigenous peoples. Um, and if you look at, if you look at the, the right of self-determination as the prerequisite to the exercise and enjoyment of all other rights, it's those rights holders that should be uh, defining um, uh, who the self is in self-determination. Thank you. Thanks, Taylor. Claire. I just wanted to also endorse um, everything that's been said by Ambassador Harper and Daly just now. And um, the first point that I wanted to, to make, um, which Daly finished on really, was that the rights holders um, with a right to self-determination, there is something about the quality of the right to self-determination that um, um, both justifies, I think, and, and also explains why so it's a participatory right to, to have a say over matters that impact on us and to have the decision-making authority actually, um, which is Diego's point. 
Um, and on the point of um, sort of Indigenous people's participation via NGOs into international uh, arena and legal arena, it's been very much a pragmatic response because in order to get a voice, um, sometimes you have to go through an NGO that has accreditation. And it can be very difficult for um, Indigenous peoples under existing rules to get that accreditation because of rules like having to be somewhat internationally representative as an NGO in order to participate. Now, by very um, definition, often, not that we should talk about Indigenous definitions, but um, Indigenous peoples are more locally based or in specific areas, for example. So we just can't get, or it's very difficult to get the requisite accreditation. So it has been a pragmatic response, but it's not a principled response. Um, and um, that's something that, that is, a, is a tension that, that, that we've had to um, get around. In terms of just the practical um, participatory um, issues, getting to Geneva or New York or wherever the, the current next current climate change meeting is going to be, I just wanted to point out that there is something called the Voluntary Fund, um, UN Voluntary Fund for Indigenous Peoples, and uh, it is um, very open to applications from Indigenous peoples from around the globe. And given that there hasn't been so much travel um, recently, it's somewhat flush um, at the moment. So um, yeah, apply there. Kia ora. Thank you, Claire. Um, Diego, did you have anything to add to that? Or have you? Okay, and Rani said that she, she's okay with that too. I guess um, we, we're, it's been very quick. I apologize. Um, we have a um, couple of minutes before we'll, this will close and we're going to um, encourage you all to move on to the continue the conversation uh, if you can in the next thing for, for another half hour. The link I think has just gone out um, to the audience as well. Um, I guess if there's one question maybe I could um, start thinking about uh, or, or prompt some discussion I guess on the continue the conversation uh, Zoom ch channel. And I guess the question I have is um, all of the, the panellists have, have agreed that the, the key Point here, I guess, is, is self-determination and Indigenous peoples determining for themselves who they are and how they'll participate and, 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 and have their say over matters that affect them. I think that's the sort of the fundamental point here that we all agree on. The, the point I have is, is what about in situations maybe that Rani's spoken about where you have a state that um, denies the existence of Indigenous peoples? What, what role can international law play in, in assisting communities and peoples um, in order to, uh, I guess, transcend the state and, and, and to remind the state or, or of its obligation that international law. Yeah, yeah. From quickly, from my perspective, I think that 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 maintaining the course and and the the, the, the your right uh, to culture and your right to cultural identity has to uh, prevail. And this is one of the problems that we're facing in a host of different intergovernmental organizations, and that is that this constant uh, phrasing of local communities. You know, we fought for decades to gain uh, this important human rights framework uh, that uh, is embodied in the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. ILO Convention number 169 is important. The American Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is important as well. But um, this problematic issue of local communities and governments like Indonesia and others uh, trying to prop this up as a way to continue the denial of the rights of indigenous peoples um, because it's indigestible to them. This, I, I think that it's important to, to, to maintain the course on your right to, to culture, your right to cultural um, identity. And I just quickly want to say that it might be useful for those interested to have a look at the reports of the International Law Association on the rights of Indigenous peoples and their most recent report on the implementation of the rights of Indigenous peoples. So thank you. Sorry to take up so much time. That's okay, Daly. I, I'm not sure now, um, Ben, has this concluded? Do we need to hit the next link? Okay, we'll wrap. Yeah, um, I just want to say sorry then, and uh, apologies that we've had to finish um, so on that, but I think it's a good note to finish on. Um, thank you, Daly, as well. I think it's uh, maintain, maintain, uh, maintain the rage is, is, is a key point here and ensure that um, continue to, to explain and fight and uh, push for Indigenous people's right to self-determination. I think it's wonderful. 
I, I think this um, panel has been great. I've really enjoyed it. I felt very honoured to be able to moderate it and hear from uh, such wonderful speakers who have got such great experience in so many different forums um, at the UN and, and at other international organisations as well, and, and such a great history of, 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 of really creating the situation we have today where certainly international law is not there, but um, it has, has been reshaped and it's continued to be reshaped by people like you um, in order to better promote and enhance the rights of Indigenous peoples. Uh, and then the, the next step, obviously, is ensuring that that then can support and assist other people um, at the domestic level as well. Um, so thank you again, all everyone. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Harper, uh, uh, Dr. Daly, Dr. Claire Charters, Diego and Rani as well. Thank you very much. Um, now, I think um, I would encourage everyone, if you're available, to please come on to the next uh, Continue the Conversation uh, panel. Um, and I daily can't make it, unfortunately. Um, Claire and myself, I don't know, we're, it's still very early here where we are, so perhaps we, we can't, that's great, excellent. So um, thanks everyone and I'll see you over there in a moment.